What's going on with you? Oh, nothing much. Oh. You know, just my whole life being turned upside down. Yeah. But you know, just a the touch, huge. just a touch of homelessness. Yeah, just a touch. But that's you know? what you want, though. I no, you don't. Oh, you no, know, you don't want it. No, it is not something anybody wants. I you think. know, I would never dare to compare my situation with the situation. Of the men and women aboard La Amistad. No, 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 no. Absolutely. But I feel not. like I'm kind of doing it right now. Oh my God. So I'll stop. Okay. And I'll start telling people this is the Just Enough Trope podcast. I'm your host, Caliban, joined as always by my co host. Hi, I'm Mikan Hana. Back from the dead. Yes, we are. Gone. Resurrected. Not forgotten? Or forgotten, maybe. In order to not be forgotten, yeah. we're back. Here we are. And so we are here to talk about uh, all the, well, it's all the cool things that happen in the world of nerdy entertainment. Right. We have to update that mm-hmm. uh, since we're not doing news on this show. But yeah, we're back to talk about a very special film in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yes. That reason that you're not going to work if you uh, work for a bank right. or uh, an educational institution or something right. governmental. Everybody else back at work. But we're here to talk about a uh, very important film, I believe, that is not directly related to it, but is related to the cause of uh, freedom and uh, Absolutely. and fighting against discrimination. And, and that movie is rights. 1997's Amistad. Mm-hmm. One of the last... Good Spielberg movies? Ooh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk he has, about it. He hasn't been good for a while. We'll so. talk about it later. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, Hot take. Fablemans. What? Okay. Why did it well, win we'll Golden Globes? There. We'll get there. Come on. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, or actually, uh, before we get to that, though, we'll be talking about, uh, we had a little mini review. Yeah. From a, <laughs> this little boutique <laughs> sort of <laughs> bespoke horror film and an art film you probably you haven't heard of it no yeah it, it might not even be showing it yeah. at a movie theater near you you know there's a lot of dignity that comes with an exploration of the arts what's it called skin of marink <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about a horror movie yeah. called skin of marink yeah it costs twenty thousand dollars to make oh my god and it is in limited release right now and uh it's a pip we're talking about that yes um in the middle of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we begin, do we want to do it? I'm literally going to set a timer so we don't spend a lot of time. Uh, this could just yeah. be a vent sesh. Yeah, we don't for want the that. whole thing. Yeah. But to avoid that, uh, we'll set a timer. I think that's a good idea. And when it goes off, we're done. Okay. Let's, uh, wh- what's up? Hey, wh- wh- what's up? <laughs> what is up? So I'm going to try to make this as brief as possible. And I'm probably going to help you along the way. Okay. But uh, the gist of it is um, our neighbor is having a mental health crisis. Yeah. And it has um, escalated since the week of Christmas. And uh, it's been going on for a while. Yeah. And we We live in a building. And it's not, um, speaking of being bespoke, it's kind of a bespoke apartment building it doesn't have a lot of uh units it's a very nice building right it's Uh, usually very quiet yeah that's why we like it yeah and uh you know i i guess it's frustrating because we have and us and the other people who live in our building have tried to um reach out to various different oh well you're not you gotta paint the whole thing okay so it's not um and we won't you know we're not gonna do any names uh, of anybody involved no um, but just to say that like, you know, we don't, we're apartment dwellers. Yes. Um, that's our home. It's not a dorm. No. You know, you don't, if, if you live in an apartment, you know, you often don't really know your apartment, the co-apartment people very well. No, you don't. It's kind of like how most people like it. Yeah. And so I didn't know the guy well, but I had, you know, run into him and talked to him a few times. He's a nice guy. Yeah. And it doesn't reflect on him at all because no, this no, is, no, we're no, talking no. about mental, mental illness here. Yeah, exactly. But which is he's very serious. He's kind of, he's really gone off the hook and he's it's kind of recognizable i think just with my experience um with family members with this that he's you know having like a psychotic episode yes um and i don't want to speculate i can't right, right, diagnose right. him but no, you know, no, no, he's no, a no. young guy um 
if something like that were to happen, this is like when it would happen. It's very common for uh, happening young around adults. the holidays. Yeah, a lot happening of added when you stress, have, like stress and trouble at work and with your family, and mm -hmm. so all these things are probably there. That's the excuse I'm going to give to him. We got to keep moving forward, and so the reason that we're not there yes. anymore right. and are somewhere else is because he has become violent, and it started with being loud. It started with like right. odd behavior. <clears throat> and kind of stomping around his apartment, and then it turned Playing into loud like music. music at eleven. Yep. Um, there's a we are sort of like right next to him. There is a couple that lives directly across the hall from him. Yes. And he began like focusing, <clears throat> like obsessing with them. Yeah, um, focusing, he's saying his aggression. Yeah, that. and like going and banging on their door and yelling at them and and all these things. And Verbal threats. Yeah, and so they basically were like, "Well, nope, we're out of here," and they yep. left. Yep. Um, and then it sort of started to spread to everybody else. Yes. And everybody felt unsafe. The cops were there every Multiple day or times. twice a day. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I think just about everybody in the building now has just kind of up up and left. And yes. uh, luckily, I think, has been able to find a place. Um, I, I, I can't speak for everybody else. Right, right, right. Um, and so now we have an apartment building that is just... Empty. Empty. And we're filled not... with one person who uh, needs some help and is not getting that help is drilling holes in the walls and destroying things the infrastructure yeah. of his own apartment. Right. And uh, we had to sneak back into our own apartment the other day and to get essentials <laughs> so we could uh, survive outside of our home. Which is really embarrassing So and that, awful. yeah. And so the first thing was, well, obviously our lives are important, uh, more important than uh, our jobs. And, and so things. maybe uh, the podcast goes on hold. Right. But you know what? It's a mobile thing, isn't it? It sure it's is. It's a thing that you can do. We have done yes. many, many things. And the more I thought about it, I thought, we've done this in hotel rooms. We've done this Cons. in this exact situation before. Yeah, right. And so we're going to continue to try and do this. And I can't promise that it's going to be the same level of quality, but the spirit and the heart's going to be there still. Absolutely. We're not going to be broken by this. No, and, and we got things to talk about. It's, it's, I think it helps, you know, because it, it gives us a sense of... I don't, I don't like the word normal, but I'm going to use it here because I don't know what else. What's normal? Yeah, I, what is normal? Having but, a home's normal. But it, I guess what I meant to say is it, it helps us get back to our own routines. Yes. So it's a little comforting. Yes. And this whole situation is very triggering. Um, and it's I feel empathy for him. And, and it has affected everyone in the building. Everyone's mental health and well-being and just to say as we kind of wrap up here uh none of the institutions who are yeah funded and designed to take care of this have done no. diddly squat we we've had <laughs> so, social workers out there i don't mean to just crap yeah on the police on mental health workers social workers but every he has fallen through every awning on the way to the ground oh absolutely and this just it's like watching something in slow motion so i can only pray and hope for the resolution of this where as soon he, as possible. he gets safe and he gets yes. the, the stuff that he needs. 100%. But as far as it goes for us, we're still doing this. As you said, it's a direction. It's who we are. It's a way to go. Give us us podcast. Yes. That's what I say. Us podcast? What? That's what he says. What? Who says? Oh, it's going to be a great talk about Amistad. <laughs> no. Okay. Now I, I get it. What is cinema? Great question. Jean-Luc Godard said, or I believe one of his characters said in his uh, film Le, Le Petit Soldat, uh -huh. that photography is truth. Cinema is truth at 24 frames a second. That's 24 times the truth. Whoa. That's, well, that's way a lot more of truth. truth. Yeah. What do you say about video? Do I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, not frames. It's different. So it doesn't come in. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. It's, Got on, it's it. on a tape. It's on a tape. <laughs> or now it's just electrons. And those electrons have come to us from the great white north to deliver a film called Skinamarink. I rink a do, Skinamarink a do. I love you. You yeah. want to just take over and do a musical for the rest of this thing, but I think that we should talk about the film Skinamarink. Although, yes. you're on to something there. You ask me, 
where's the title of this film come from? Yeah. And I've got an answer for you. You do. Fantastic. Let's it hear it. It comes from that song. But hold on. <laughs> There's never more. never play it or sing it. Get out your effing checkbook. Uh-oh. It is. No, they don't play it or say it. But it is or was made popular by a children's TV show in Canada from the late 80s and early 90s. That and, okay. is going to be important right. as we discuss this film, Skinnamarink. Mm-hmm. It is spelled, I always thought it was Skinnamarink, but it's spelled Skinnamarink, perhaps maybe to avoid if somebody has copyrighted or trademarked oh, Skinnamarink. Uh-huh. So it's with an N. It's by a director named Kyle Edward Ball. He's a director and writer. This is his first feature. I never would have guessed. And this was uh, basically, you know, released by IFC. Uh, and we'll be releasing on Shudder. Uh, it's probably out this weekend on Shudder. Um, and the release was the 13th of January. So why Friday release? the 13th. Yeah. It, it showed at, uh, it showed at um, festivals. And then apparently, and I mean, you know, is anything really, is any mistake organic these days? But apparently it somehow got leaked. And it showed well at festivals. People said good things sure. about it. Mm-hmm. And then a copy of it got leaked somehow. And then it started to drum interest, uh, interest on the internet. And I so see. that led to its uh, theatrical release here in January. Yes. The, the crowning period of all good movies mm-hmm. and their releases. Right. Um, <laughs> as far as you can. Oh, God. As far as you're able, let us know what happens in Skin and Rink, or at least like set the scene for us. Okay. Well, I don't know when it takes place exactly. 1995 says okay. it at the very beginning. Uh, I missed that. I knew it was in the 80s or 90s because of certain clues. But um, it takes place in a home. Uh, we never see the people's places. There's a mom and a dad, a little girl, and a little boy. The girl's name is Kaylee. The boy's name is Kevin. Two Ks. Um, and uh, there's a lot of angles, a lot of things cut off. Uh, and it's kind of, it's uh deliberate pacing i would say and um basically it takes place it feels like one night but then at one point it says something else which i I was confused about maybe we can talk about um but uh it feels like it takes place in one night and it's scary and it's kind of from the kid's perspective um because uh things are disappearing and reappearing in the house uh, it's kind of like, you know, what you see in the night and the night's playing tricks on you. But it's also like they can't find their mom and dad during periods. And then they do find them. And then they're acting weird. What's going on? What's happening? Then Kevin disappears for a while. What is happening? We need to balk about Kevin. Yeah, right. I don't think that's accurate because this movie didn't balk on no, anything. No. And we're talk about it mm-hmm. right now. Uh, ball... Originally was, believe it or not, I don't know how old he is, but it's safe to say he's probably a Zoomer, at least a younger probably. millennial. Yeah. Um, he got to start like making short films um, on the internet. And sure. apparently on YouTube, he has a channel where he makes short films. And he said to his followers, like, you know, let me know like what scared you as a child. Like what's something that you okay, sure. found scary or... It right. just seemed like a ra- irrational, you know, you were afraid as a child, but now it's like, oh, okay, it's not that scary. Mm-hmm. And apparently this and what the things that happened in this film are compiled from those things. He took like the okay. things that, you know, across a spectrum of people was the most scary. Mm-hmm. So it's partially, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> are you sure he's not like a... Uh, studio executive what would you find is this scary is this scary would you find right. would you find a robot right. uh, with a sword scary right or, or would you want something more grounded right oh or, you want magical and grounded well it reminds me of like the studio executive going into the comic book shop with a neatly pressed shirt I and... would call this no there's a crease in it oh there's a crease in it back. right Tell yeah story right. okay sorry I, I would call it less but I'm going to take this guy's word that he's an artist it's less I think focus grouped and more crowdsourced Mm. you know he's trying to find something it's also a very personal film it was shot at his mom's house are you kidding me yes and wow his name's kyle but the boy's name is kevin and he has a sister she might be named kelly kaylee i don't know probably a k name maybe kelly 
Mm -hmm. And so it is, you know, an attempt to kind of recreate his childhood in a way. So he was, okay. you know, five or six in 1994. So he's a, a Zoomer. Yeah. Um, right? I don't know how it works. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think so. it cost $15,000 Canadian. That's $20,000 okay. in the U.S. Right. Um, and yeah, it's about, it's a little over uh, 90 minutes long. It's uh, an hour 40 something. Uh-huh. And I have to say, sometimes it feels longer. Okay. Sometimes so it feels we've shorter. A, we've got somebody who's trying to be uh, a film critic, and we've got somebody who's got an axe to grind. <laughs> hey! Mostly because she didn't see an axe in the thriller <laughs> killer movie that she saw. Um, he says that he is influenced by filmmakers. Uh, I'll just pick one name at random out of the list. David Lynch. Wow. And I'm like, uh, can I, I edit uh -huh. Wikipedia to go, oh, da doy. <laughs> <laughs> How many eyes in da doy? I don't know. I would, if I had to compare this to anything, I would say that it is Lynchian, maybe specifically, um, well, you haven't seen Inland Empire. I was no, going to say for the no. video, maybe Inland Empire. Sure. But I would say maybe Lost Highway esque. Okay, I could see that. Mixed with um, Revulsion. Uh, yeah. The mm -hmm. yeah the we don't talk about I him actually, anymore guy. Yeah, I actually while we, I was watching the movie, it was kind of I thought about revulsion. Funny enough, mm -hmm. um, and I also thought of what is that uh, foreign film? Was is it Persona? Is that what it's called? Where it's like the lady she gets she goes on vacation and she meets this other lady and she gets oh Bergman. Yeah. Oh, we're going up to the to rarefied air. I yeah. guess I started talking about Godard. Yeah. It's actually repulsion, isn't it? It doesn't, it doesn't translate exactly, but it's it's repulsion. Yeah, okay. All we don't right. want to sound like dumb <laughs> film experts. Oh, uh, no. We want to sound like uh, just kind of dull film experts. <laughs> and also a little bit of, which hasn't been a movie yet, but the book, The House of Blue Leaves. Oh, sure. By yep. Poe's brother. Yes, I can't remember his name right now. Daniel either. Polish name. Are they Canadian? They seem Canadian. That's a great question that I don't know the answer to. Oh, Johnny. Angry Johnny. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, and so all of those things come together to make this thing. And the reason I asked what is cinema beforehand, because it's like, what is cinema? Is it a plot? Is cinema right. is cinema narrative? Mm -hmm. Is cinema character? Is cinema setting and mise-en-scene? Right. Maybe that's the one. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the one leg that this stool is balancing on i think you're right because it doesn't have any of the other three not as really. far as i'm concerned not really yeah i mean you don't and i think that you know it not showing the faces was definitely a choice and it was kind of like a way to distance yourself from the characters but i also felt like and probably didn't want to do this but i felt like as a viewer that I might have felt more invested in this film if there was at least one scene at the beginning that like was just a scene of this family so I could see what their dynamic was before all of this the rest of the film happened. This ain't the Babadook. I know, but you know what? I thought about the Babadook too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's na and a, a film like the 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 critics like you know the Atlantic the New Yorker they're already jerking themselves raw over this. Of course they are. I think that's a bit of an overreach because, um, and I don't know if we're gonna give like thumbs up thumbs down, but like my kind of thumbs up thumbs down review is that it's good, but it's it's amateurish, and if it is meant, yeah. if you choose bleak, you will have a problem having the audience attached to your film. Yes. Yes. And and that is kind of, you know, what we are looking at here. Mm -hmm. Although I think when you specifically say there are names, but there are no characters, there's not even any faces. I'm not asking you to hope that the little girl gets out of the poltergeist or whatever. That's not what we're doing here. Right. Um, you know, he committed to that and he delivered that. You know, I was thinking about the Lynch aspect of it and it almost, you know, Lynch. So <laughs> when we call something Lynchy and it's usually, you know, it feels creepy, but don't never forget David Lynch is a filmmaker. He is. You know, when he says that cinema is a highway, he's talking about being in the car, feeling the thrum of the motor, the lights on the highway, what's beyond those lights that you can't see. Seeing the dotted being lines. Being in the night. Yeah. The dotted line being the the um, 
thing of the the the, the thing of the film. Right, right. Didn't go to film school. The, the, the real, holes, the on, holes the side, on the yeah, the holes on the side. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so he is he's a filmmaker through and through, a Absolutely. cinema man. Yeah. But he made something called Rabbits, which is a TV show on video. Mm-hmm. And, I've never seen it. But okay, it this is Rabbits Lynch, or this is okay. si- very similar to Inland Empire. I think. Okay. When he does video, he's kind of doing something else. All right. And. You want to talk about del- deliberate pace? Yes, I think that's a saying. Cinema yeah, play- way I know mood it. is doom. Let's right. do it. Right, right, right. Uh, that is rabbits. Rabbits uses incidental, you know, diegetic sound like TVs, cartoons, and things like that. Sure. And then just like random bits of dialogue. There I are mean, parts. That's this for sure. Yeah, there are um, lines that are subtitled. And In there this are film? lines, yes, yeah. that are not. And there are lines yeah. where subtitles come up and nobody has said anything. And he, um, the filmmaker said specifically that he, it was partially for clarity because you're, mm-hmm. the entire thing is like all bad sound. I'm whispering. <laughs> it's not just room tone. Voce. Yeah. It's like bad print, you know, like 35 or eight millimeter print sound. And also, so it's partially for clarity, but it's also because in some of the online horror videos that he's seen. Mm-hmm. Th- that happens too. There okay. will be, you know, there will be l- l- subtitles for lines that a ghost is saying, like, uh, ah, "I can smell your feet" or whatever, and so you'll put the line down there. And so I he's trying to evoke that sort of thing yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and there's also just like, and so that all works. And then again, that's sort of like, oh, okay, a final a TikTok guy is going to make a horror movie. This is what it looks like, maybe. Mm-hmm. That or um, missing. What is missing? Oh, that's the the one we saw. Yeah, yeah. I'm but kind of intrigued. But, but it's yeah, also I know. it's an interesting choice because it it's it's a it's a choice to let you know that even the movie is not sure what's going on, and right. that really I think puts the audience off when you watch. We were talking about this before, but like one of the reasons that I really like this, and I think that the people who are responding to it are responding to it, and there's you know people. Like it and also don't like it. It's kind of like you love it or hate it. Is that it is eschewing everything that we expect when we go to a, see a, a movie. When you go to see Annabelle, whichever one they're on, you right. know it's going to jump out and scare you. Mm-hmm. But you also know that it's going to jump out and scare you every 15, 20 minutes. And that the music is going to tell you whether you should be happy or sad. Right. That you know when you're getting near the end because the music's really going crazy. And then they exercise the doll. I've never seen one of them. And so all of those rhythms <laughs> are there to the point where be. you could turn off the dialogue and the music would tell you how to feel. Yeah, right. And he's saying, we're not doing that. I'm not doing any of that. This is all just things that you would experience and it is separated from the general, you know, the the, the mise-en-scene and the tropes of cinema. And mm-hmm. so, sure, there's going to be some words, but even the words are coming out of nowhere or there's no words, and you're like, man, I really wish I knew what that person said. Yeah, and so yes, like, absolutely. The, the 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 director, the the, the projectionist, the, the idea that the cinema, you know, the movie itself is going to hold your hand is gone. Yeah, you know, it's it's the feeling, and which is done to death now, and has been examined and and chewed up and swallowed and come out through your in- intestines. Uh, the idea of like found footage, yeah, itself yes, yep, has yep. become this polished kind of thing, the paranormal activity or whatever. And Mm -hmm. this is, this is like popping in like a bunch of random tapes. Yeah. And and you're just like, I don't, what is the context for any, what is this? Well, what does this shot mean? What does the image I'm seeing mean? Right, right, right. To the point where there's, it's probably like an artificial grain. I don't know what they shot it on, but there's kind of a grain and then you're looking at nothing. You're looking into a darkened hallway and the the movie is allowing you to do that thing that you do sometimes. Mm-hmm. We've all been in a spot where we weren't exactly sure who was in the house or what was going on, and you think you see something, and you stare at something for so long that you're you, you begin to see patterns in the thing. Like the human brain can just not not do that. Yeah, it reminded right. me of, and I can't remember the name of it now, but the highly criticized but sometimes praised like 15 minute long silent shot from the Bobcat Goldwaith Bigfoot movie. I don't know what you're talking about. We saw a Bobcat Gold we talked about it on the show and a couple goes looking for Bigfoot and it's in the vein of a well, of a Blair a of a Blair Witch mm-hmm. and there's a scene where they hear that oh the, Bigfoot's out here 
and they right. go to sleep in their tent. But at night they hear like a sound and the girl, she's like, oh, wake up, wake up, wake up. and they both sit up and they're listening for a sound. And the scene goes on for like 10 minutes. Right. And you hear like, and it, it does culminate into something, but you're like, what are you doing a thing? What are we doing here? But it's the experience that everybody has had of mm-hmm. being camping. Maybe it's your first time. You're not sure what's out there. You hear something and your brain could just say, obviously it's nothing. Or if it gets worse, I will wake up and know about it. If a wolf shows up, I, that's when I'll have to defend myself. But you can't not listen. You can't pull your attention away. Right. And like, I felt like that this film very um, deftly captured that idea. If that's entertainment, I don't know. If you should watch it on half a Benadryl, do not. No. Or mm-hmm. do because it will increase the dreamlike quality of it. It is very dreamlike. And I, you know, I did not have half a Benadryl. And I guess I still was really tired because, man, I was drifting in and out of sleep. And there are <laughs> there are parts of it because it, it's, you know, taking place in a, a fairly dark house. And you're a little kid. Yeah. Little kid. Um, You know, it would go all black for for certain moments and like it was completely dark and you couldn't see anything. It was never completely dark. Well, uh, okay, but it was fairly dark. They're shooting, they're shooting dark. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. shooting dark. Um, so it was like, uh, oh my God, oh my God, uh, the you tracks. know, s- stay away. That's on the side of the film. Yeah. Um, Sorry, <laughs> I gotta warm remember? up my film, my film a school brain. Yeah. That I don't have, I borrowed, I got it secondhand. I mean, I guess I can relate to some of the things that the the kids were feeling like i think mostly um you know waking up in the middle of the night having a nightlight there in the hallway to show you where you're going and then at one point so uh the nightlight falls out or is taken out we don't know and so it's not there and it's not giving you light and so it's completely it's it appears to be dark to the kid and then they put it back in. I can relate to that. Like I had to sleep with a nightlight for a really long time. I was afraid of the dark. Don't tell us that, but okay. Well, uh, I don't care there. Yeah. There's that is, we don't really know what's, what's up with the nightlight, but we don't know what's up with a lot of stuff. No, there's a lot of shots of the, um, the, you know, the accoutrements of a childhood, you know, Legos and Duplos and things. Dolls. And they move. And we don't know if the kids are moving them because of their play or if something else is moving them. Right. And I don't mean it's like, <laughs> it's less, uh, ooh, it's spooky, it's moving. And maybe more, why is, who's moving the glass at the end of Stalker? That's mm-hmm. right. Now I'm comparing it yeah, to Tarkovsky. Okay. Wow. Right? Like it's more, I don't. There is motion for the sake of motion, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know whose motion it is. There is so in the synopsis to the uh, movie, you'll see that like doors and windows are just dis- have disappeared. Yeah, that's and there's a little sound to it. it. Yeah, but that's not. I thought that that was going to be a plot point. But right, this movie would require a plot Agreed. for there to be plot. Points. There is no plot, and that's what reminded me of the House of Leaves thing. Is it House of Leaves? It's just House of Leaves instead of House of Blue Leaves. That's Blue Leaves is something else. Okay, um, because that is all about. A weird house, which is a metaphor for the disintegration of a family. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to talk about. This is just about trauma, right? This is about trauma. Uh, and I abuse. think it is <laughs> like absolutely like about all, trauma. So what's zoom? What's wrong with Zoomers? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> they had to grow up in the 21st century. That's what's wrong. Yeah, right. Um, well, at one point, really early on in the film, the kids were together, and they're like, "Why is mommy crying?" Uh, so they they heard their mom crying. So that's not good. Um, and then also not being able to find your parents and like yeah. at the beginning you're like, well, this is a horror movie. So did one of them kill the other one and the other one killed? I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, and I don't, the filmmaker has no, no intention to let you know what's going no, on. No. And yeah, I get that. And, and I think that's why it is, you know, as a, as a piece and experience of cinema, it's something unique. There's, there's nothing that they could have done better than to show us the three shitty trailers for the new upcoming shitty movies. You know, the, oh, it's, she's looking for her mom online brought to you by Apple. And she's going to, I I Google, I went on Fiverr and I found an old actor to, to look for her for me. Right. And then like, also like the M night Shyamalan one, 
I if I this can't if he M. made Night this, Shyamalan. the kids would be would be plucky. They would be smart. Of course they and would. And they would figure something out. And you'd see but in their this faces. movie, the kids are like, "I'm four. I don't I don't know what's going on. I got no idea what's I'm going on." I'm just gonna on. watch old cartoons until on the we TV. run out of cereal and then yeah. I'm in trouble. Right, right, right. Yeah, and juice boxes. Yeah, but yeah, but com- starting off with like <laughs> just like here's more crap. And then, like, downshifting immediately into this was like, whoa, all right, well, was something else. It was rough, and, I, you know, it started slow at the beginning, and I was like, okay, we're just we're just getting started here. We're filling it out. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really pick up. It, and it was just, you know, there were, there were times where it was tension, times where it was um, more traumatic, uh, but it didn't, like you said, it didn't really have a plot. There wasn't really character because we never saw their faces never really got to know them so it was just like i i would again say deliberately paced and i i wouldn't say that it was boring but i feel like it was tense and you kept waiting for something to happen because you're like like at one point one of the kids goes upstairs and they find their dad but he's both their parents are acting weird whenever I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're always like this, but I, I, I would think this is weird. Like sitting on the edge of the bed and not talking to them right away and not looking at them. And then their dad says, look under the bed. Why, as a parent, would you say that to your child when they're, you know, kids are typically scared of whatever the heck is under their bed? And we won't say what's under the bed, but it's not the monster from behind the dumpster at the Stuckies. <laughs> No, from, from Mulholland Drive. No, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it is not that. But it, but it, it felt like that to me. Yeah, yeah. You're. I was like, I was like, I put my hand over my mouth because I was like, something is going to jump out or we're going to see something. But we could just see darkness. That's all it was. Okay, I guess we are going to tell you what's under there. Oh, uh, sorry. It's I, impossible I, to ruin this film. Mika's going to do her darndest. Would you recommend this film? Um. I guess yes. I, I personally, I didn't know what to expect going into it, and maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. But I guess I would just say, keep an open mind, <laughs> and uh, just know. Uh, go to an early show. <laughs> yes, right. Make sure don't go you if you're tired. Have a lot of coffee. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, what would you recommend it? Uh, yeah, I would because I want to tell IFC and Shutter to take more chances and Hollywood in general. I mean, compared to, you know, as pre- previously mentioned, the uh, M Night movie or I, Transformers, it's dinosaurs and Beast Wars this time or right. What? I, how much of a dent are you really going to make? But um, this did get you know kind of a limited release. Uh, it's probably near you, and I think that if you have an opportunity, go check it out. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's definitely something that you can talk about. You might feel cheated at first, but then when you think about the Transformers are just going to try to take each other's faces anyway. I mean, I will and say you'd have that nothing to talk about. I will but you say have this. something to talk about at the end. You of do. This. And it is different. It does, like you were saying, kind of feel like a first film or like a really artsy film. It's it's not it's not a typical horror thriller, I don't think, you know, but um, <laughs> well, it, it, there's you know there's not a lot of jump scares there's not a lot of uh gore but you know anyways um that's all i'm gonna say because i don't want to ruin anything else <laughs> oh i thought you were building up to something no i uh maybe uh 90 seconds of spoilers <laughs> before we end the segment oh okay we can do that i like that it didn't have any of those things that you talked about but it, it's it doesn't treat you like you're dumb no. And it doesn't bother to explain to you because you want, so the mind craves a narrative so much. And yes, the fact that, that was a little bit of an the issue The whole time, me. yeah, but the issue, you know what happened. The parents killed these kids. We're done. That's it. Mm. And then the kid went to hell or heaven. We don't know. Apparently, uh, Canadian kids are scared of spooky doors with a barely visible face behind it. <laughs> oh my God, it's Robert Blake. Run, kid, run. <laughs> but that's that's what happened. That's it. Mm. And so they do things like they pick up the phone and they dial the phone and it's beep, bop, boop. Uh, and you're like, oh, I don't know what that is. And then it's beep, beep, beep. 911. Which would be like something else in Canada. It would Canada. be something Actually, else. Actually, no, I think 911 works in Canada. Okay. But, we drive, but they don't say that. And then it isn't until like yeah. two thirds of the way through the movie that the kid dials 911 and gets through and it's like 911. Okay. Thanks for rewarding me, movie. I'm smart because I know that the person who dialed three numbers did it. And then 
at one point, one of the kids gets a flashlight that's going around. Later, at the end of the movie, there's another flashlight. But every time it comes on, it goes. Mm-hmm. It's got a little button. Yeah. It's a mag light. The cops are here. They're looking at the crime scene now. That's oh, when we start to see blood. I didn't get that's that. That's when we see pictures of the family with the faces erases. Because oh. these are when you're getting photos out for the funeral or for... You know, to put on the news or whatever. See, I didn't get this that is all part. that's left of them at yeah. that point. So that is that is a policeman who is there now. But you have no, you have no indication from the movie what the POV is of whose whose P is it? Well, right. Whose P is this? Right, right, right. And uh, it it changes like you're saying. Like a lot of times, it's the kids, uh, and then I guess at the end, it's the cops. And I but didn't, you don't, I, and I didn't you don't know, know that. it's not the parents. At sometimes, no, I'm, it it could be. Yeah, and the parents. I don't know what's going on. The parents. It's messed up. Like at one point, the mom says to Kaylee, uh, "Put this knife in your eye." What? What? I told you to get me some Molson. The year is 1839, and oh boy, things are happening. Ah, uh, yeah. Tell me about All it. over the world. Uh-huh. But especially in that scrappy little country <laughs> called the United States of America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or Estados Unidos. Oh, very as nice. To, as Ruiz and Montez find out. When they, what if the whole movie is just about them? They, they oh were God. two slave drivers. It's like Rosie but when Cranston one day, I don't want to wait. So oh my God, everybody's dead, and they want us to go. But they'll together, they'll, they'll find a way to get back what's theirs. Oh my God. Oh my God. La Amistad. <laughs> no. Da-da. That's horrible. I mean, it's very creative what you did, but I hate everything about it. Let, well, there's a lot of characters in this, and a lot, yes. of, a lot of people have interests, and it really only uh, comes down to like one or two people, but uh, maybe three uh, for the guy going for the Oscar. Uh, no Oscars. This film won no Oscars. You are kidding me. nominated for no Oscars, <gasps> uh, which is literally racism, uh, but we'll get they to were, that. This whole movie was robbed and everybody in it. We'll get to that uh, later after you tell us what happens in Amistad. Oh, Lord. Um... I'm going to try to make this brief, uh, and, and I'm not going to do it at the, at the very beginning of the film because I think it's just easier to give uh, a background. So what happens is, um, <clears throat> who who does the initial um, capturing? I, it's hard for me to follow. Uh, there were slaves, or not slaves, excuse me. What are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> there were There were... People in Africa, specifically in Sierra Leone, who were captured against their will, they were not slaves, um, and uh, they were then brought to Cuba, which was at the time uh, in control of Spain, and uh, they were Spanish slave drivers, and they basically traded them like goods as if they were slaves from Cuba, and then they were brought to they were on their way to Which the United States. Which they had to States. do. This is the dry, I'm glad that, see, this is the reason that the movie opened the way it, the way did, it did so compellingly because yeah. this is right. dry stuff. But, I know. Because slavery is legal, in, in obviously, in the U.S. at this time. And Cuba, but I'm assuming. W- at the beginning of the century, uh, the, the international powers, yeah. most including the U.S. and Britain, made a law that the, the slave trade should be done. Now, that's like shutting the barn door after all the cows are out. Right. Because you don't need to trade slaves anymore, which is a vile, nasty business, because you've got <laughs> a bunch of slaves who make more slaves. Your crimes make more crimes. It's awful. They have baby slaves, so you don't need the trade. That's just horrifying to to think about. And, capitalism. And, well, and, and capitalism. that's a part of slavery that I feel like you are not taught in school. Right. And Britain themselves, by this time, uh, at the beginning of the decade of the uh, 30s, uh, had gotten rid of slavery altogether. Right. Um, and they were trying to abolish it For a it lot of different over. reasons. Well, they were trying to pressure other countries to do it. But because they are the British Navy, the biggest Navy in the world, mm. they're able to really enforce this, you know, stopping all the slave trade type things. Right. So slavery's not over, but no. some concessions have been made towards, you know, not making it an international uh, source of trade and, and whatnot. So these guys had to... <clears throat> 
obviously you still want to sell slaves and people still want to buy slaves. Right. And so we pick up the movie with these two guys who, and I don't know what they're, they did for business before this. That's why I think it's like, there's the joke of there's a scrappy movie yeah. about two entrepreneurs. We got to get these slaves. Hey, right, right. Uh, it's, and it's, there's, there's Harold and Kumar go to Cuba, oh my God. go to the slave fortress. And so they are doing this, like they're, they're, uh, money laundering slaves, basically. Yes, they're they're yes. taking free people, taking them From to Cuba, Africa. giving yes. them fake names, right. filing the serial numbers off these slaves, and then trying to pass them off as it's uh, just horrifying. legal slaves. But the guys from Sierra Leone, they did not take this line down. No, no. And this guy who, I don't know if he was the leader of all of them, but he just kind of stepped up. <clears throat> and uh, basically, they he the way they tell it, and I... They got out of their chains. They were down in the the bowels of the ship, and they got out of their chains. This is how long it takes to say slave revolt. It was a slave revolt, and they they killed. I'll say. Okay, they killed everybody who was on board, including the captain, except for the slave traders who were Spanish who bought them in Cuba. For some reason, they kept them alive, um, and they wanted them to help them. They they're not used. They're to not ships. seamen. They're not seamen, so they wanted them to help guide the ship back to Africa, but they're a-holes and they tricked them. <laughs> and so they, they brought them to America instead. And a is how yeah. you say that in Spanish. There you go. Um, uh, yeah. And so they were captured, I think, by the American Navy. Yeah, like the Coast Guard, basically. Yeah. So, well, what's going on here? Right. And basically the rest of the film is they were, it was a huge trial uh, about civil rights and the biggest discussion is where are these people originally from? Are they from Africa? Are they from Cuba? Yeah. And are they slaves is, or free people? Yeah. And on my leftist podcast, this entire conversation could be about the complete dehumanization yes. of a case like this. Yes. But I'll just be on my non leftist podcast, Just Enough Trope, I will just quickly say that the entire thing is is framed initially as a property dispute. Of course. They're either property or not. There's yes. no question of human rights at no, stake here. No, 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 here. you're absolutely right. And the right. movie does set that up, but doesn't ever really examine that, the mm -hmm. dehumanization of capitalism. It's more just, how could look at how cool and hot these men are and how they you know, are just like us. Mm -hmm. How could we say they're property? Not... Capitalism is asking our government to decide whether these men are property. And if right. they are, then start working. Right. If you're not, well, I don't care what happens to you. Right, right, right. That's the real story here, isn't it? But that's yeah. not the story that Steven Spielberg wants to tell. No. And yeah, this is directed by Steven Spielberg. And I think you said that at the beginning. And there's some big names in it. Um, Matthew McConaughey oh, is in it. Oh, the white guy is crawling out of the woodwork. Oh, my God. But Morgan Freeman's in it as well. Um, as and a character that didn't exist. Cool. He's so like one cool. of the only characters that's not real. Yeah. Um, and uh, Anthony Hopkins is in it. And help me say his name. Uh, I always mess it up. John. Tw oh, what? Try. 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 I, I, I tell you. Oh, my it. God. I don't know why I can't say that. Let me let me practice one more time. Tritlogy. <laughs> Hold on. I, I write this down. <laughs> no. I, I'm butchering this man's name and I feel horrible about it. I got to practice it off the podcast. I can't say it anymore. But he plays a character who is from the general area where these uh, uh, free people are from. And what's his last name? <sighs> oh, no. Uh, you, you, it, you're it, making content. It's Twiddle 4. Okay. <laughs> Like the French word for star? I don't know. I want to say... Etoile du Nord? Yeah, right. Um, this is awful. But he he is kind of like a translator. They find him and, oh God, <laughs> he's able to help the, the slaves because they're, they're having trouble communicating because the Americans, they, they uh, you know, some of them speak Spanish, but they don't speak the language that uh, these Africans speak. Right. So, um, and it's there's a little bit of commentary. I don't, not everything in this movie is bad. Uh, there's a little bit of commentary right. where the uh, the the profet they get a professor from uh, you know, Harvard or whatever the East Coast uh, school who's like a linguist and he's like trying to talk to the Africans and they're like, What is this guy talking about? Yeah, it's I know. Complete and the guy's like, Oh, yeah, I know, I think I understand what they're saying now. Like, it's just, yeah, they have no knowledge of these people and their cultures at no, all. No, no, not at all. Because why would you? Right. You they've never, 
They've never been to Africa. It's going to whip them. Yeah. Well, anyway, oh that goodness. more or less you, um, I guess, got it <laughs> figured out. Uh, we can ruin it. It's a historical event. It is. They are freed. Yes. Very, very eventually. Yeah. And there in are a real lot of life, things that happen. this really happened <clears> that <throat> they, it was initially a case. And there are many concerns in this property case. Right. The Queen of Spain. Yes. Uh, you know, basically said, uh, put a writ in or whatever and said, no, no, this is, you they know, they are a royal Spanish property. Yeah. Um, the sailors uh, or the slave guys who uh, were caught in the first place are like, these are legitimate slaves. There are slaves. The British ship uh, or sorry, the uh, American ship that found them is like, this is a salvage situation because mm-hmm. the ship is adrift and everybody's dead and mm-hmm. the, it's run by a bunch of properties on it. Nobody's, yeah. this is our ship. Right. Um, the American government had an interest in it because Martin Van Buren, who was up for re-election at that point yeah. after his first President. term, yeah. wanted um, like a political win and he wanted to uh, keep relations with Spain you know, going. Make a statement. And so he was just going to hand them right back to... And so the, the only people who... The people who needed the advocate the most that had no advocacy at all was the slaves themselves. Mm-hmm. And not slaves, I should say. Yeah, free men. The, yeah. Um, the Sierra Leoneans mm-hmm. uh, who... Are, there's a bunch of them and there's a couple different like characters and stuff, but they're all really like centered in the figure of Joseph Sinke. Yeah. Played yeah. by Jamon Hunsu. Oh, and oh God, I didn't realize that's who it was. Who this is his first major role. He I mean, did outside an of an amazing a, job. You know, maybe a Janet Jackson video or something. Like he hadn't really done anything. And I had read that he it was very late into the process. They were like weeks before shooting and they Hadn't found anybody, you know, oh to play God. this guy. That's um, such an important role. There's a couple famous black actors of the time who had kind of bounced off of it. Like, mm. I can't think of any names right now. But anyway, it's the mid-90s. Whoever's like a, maybe Denzel Washington or something like right, that. Right, right, right. And, um, and they had just, um, this guy just sent his tape in. And like I said, he had been a model. Um, he's from Benin, but mm. uh, had grew up in like France, I believe. And had been a model and had done some acting and just sent his tape in and did, you know, a speech from the thing, but then also did it. He like learned Mende to do it. Oh my God. And they're like, this guy's great. He's he, fantastic. And he's, of course, he's gone on to what I think has should have been a bigger career, but he's, he's around. He's been doing stuff. He, he has been doing stuff. And I think he, whenever he shows up in something, I'm like, oh, Jimon Hutsu. I, I love him. I would um, love to see him do, and maybe I, he's done it and I've missed it, but I'd love to see him do something funny. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's got funny chops if you give him a chance. Yeah, I mean he was kind of funny without trying to be funny in Guardians of the Galaxy. That's true. Yeah, but unfortunately, Scary Black Man is kind of what we cast him as. And yeah, right. He's. I, I think that he kind of, he looks that way in this. I think Spielberg. I think Spielberg. Yeah, on purpose does it like this. But as you get to know him, and then when we're finally let into the conversations of. Um, the guy speaking Mende through tr- through the subtitles and translation. Yeah, you start to like realize the depth of like, oh, this guy's like, he's really trying to figure out what's going on, and he's getting mad like anybody else would. Of and course, if, if they threw, um, you know, Edmund Dantes, you know, into a prison, you know, he would be the same way. He'd be mad. He'd be trying to figure out what's going on. He'd be emotional, and so you, yeah. it's just that like, I don't know if it's, I think it's intended, but whether or not it's intended, it's that commentary of somebody I don't know is angry they're scary but when right. i understand what's going on figure. with them it's yeah. like well we got to get this guy out of here yeah, yeah i'm mad too yeah he's he's really well spoken he's had all these um you know powerful experiences in his home country yeah. and I, I get the feeling and i don't know if it's ever explicitly said but i get the feeling that in his home country and in his area that he lived in he was a chief or at least very high well, he, up he says specifically you know i'm not a chief i'm oh. not a speaker or something like that but i'm he, just somebody who is i'm tired of this he's he became and the they leader relate, of them well yeah because he's you know he's a he's a noble kind of character in a movie yeah. he's also i'm sure he's also the character who is really the only character that has been sort of memorialized from the experience, mm-hmm. from the real thing. Like he was a real guy. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm sure that there are plenty of people, you know, who were unlawfully detained who also contributed to their defense or right. went on to something great. But for some reason, you know, we, we only have room in our history's head for like one guy. And so Sink has become yeah, the guy. Because he, yeah, he was the guy. Yeah. He but was I love the face of the whole thing. But I love that story that they, and his, 
uh, story is kind of paralleled by Baldwin, who is somewhat less compelling as a character, but he's played by Matthew McConaughey, so we like him. Right. And he's like, I'm just a ambulance chasing lawyer, you know, and then I meant, and it, it's funny because <clears throat> he, he sticks with the case and he makes it his yeah. thing. And there's also a, there's, there's a, a lot of uh, funny shaped hats with buckles on it in this, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. In this movie. There's too many hats in this movie, right, right, but right. it's also kind of a legal thing where he's a lawyer who's throwing his entire practice away, you know, over this. Um, his principles yeah his practice and so he finds himself out of his depth just like Sinke does and I love the story that he relates which he ne- we never find out how he learns it we just accept it but there's also some kind of some, some scripting or some sort of uh, it's hard to uh, sometimes things just show up in the story and you're yeah. like where'd that come from yeah, yeah we yeah. had a lot to cover right, right, right. but he tells a story about how everybody knows that you know he killed a lion and right. that's why they really look up to Sinke and he's like I was like asleep and a lion showed up. <laughs> Any, anybody else would try There's a to There's a lion outside same. of my hut and my kids are like sleeping and I just grabbed a rock and threw it and like the lion died. And I was like, I don't know. Everybody thought it was really great and they all heroic gave me a Sizzler gift certificate. Right, and I'm right, like, right. I don't know what's going on. I right. just killed this thing. Yeah. But then McConaughey makes the point, but it's not just that. It's like you and people you don't know, hundreds of you were put in a ship and like whipped and starved. And you were like, I'm not taking this. And you broke yeah, out. He rebelled. And that's like, they're trying to call that murder. And it's that's you defending. That's the most American thing of all. Defending your rights. You know, yeah, he, was, right, right. he was protecting your freedom. Yes. And so we have to tell that story uh, when they go to see. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, uh, Martin, or not Martin Van Buren, um, John Quincy Adams. Yes. He says right off the bat before he is even <laughs> helping them that it's about the story. You got to tell a story. Yeah. What is their story? Because we need to. It human- should be that we just respect their rights. Oh, There's yeah. all these subtle criticisms. This thing is this whole movie is presented as this Amer- this amazing American success story of, mm-hmm. of our principles winning out. Right. But everybody that they're fighting is Americans. Is the American system, is the American court system, is the American president who is caving to pressure from John Calhoun and the southern states over this issue. Really, it's an indictment of our system. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But it's not presented like that. It's presented like we did it. And ultimately, the guy that did it was this former president who... I don't know if he actually felt like he was a failure because his dad was a president before him. It's funny that all this happened after the Iraq war, but before September 11th mm. and George W. Bush was yeah. elected as president. Yeah, good point. So it looks a lot different through a different lens. Uh, I hadn't past, thought about it like that. Uh, not, I'm not going to blame it all on 9-11, but it didn't help. Um, but like it's all framed as that. And so I don't know if he really felt like, but it's it's shown as like he's also a noble man who was president, but has been somewhat humbled. But then he steps up to the task. Funny fact, Baldwin actually argued the case in front of the Supreme Court. Oh, you're kidding. It was tried for like three or four days uh-huh. and and Baldwin started off. Oh. Uh, and then um, Adams, Adams Adams came in to close it. Like, oh, at the end. OK. Well, so that would be and I, I understand why this whole time you've had Anthony Hopkins kind of haunting this movie around the edges. And then he come in and he gives that well written. Amazingly, I would yes. love to imagine that this is what it's like when people argue things in front of the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, like whether Hooters can do right. all the dumb cases that well, come before the Supreme Court. So that's yes. why it's that actor's moment. But it would have been a little great for Baldwin, too, to see this guy who is just like arguing over wh- who owns this plow. Yeah. get to defend this case in front of the Supreme Court and really see his like personal uh, vocational ambitions be mm-hmm. uh, validated. Well, and I think Baldwin is, uh, you, you've basically said this, but he's incredibly passionate. And I think that, you know, at, at the beginning, and I don't know if this is, uh, you know, historically accurate or not, but Baldwin was seeking help and uh, legal advice from John Quincy Adams. And he's, he's reluctant to do anything because he's basically retired. Yeah. And like, he has experience being a lawyer, though, and he's familiar with the law, and people respect him yeah. um, because – and some people – He was see, also a supporting of, of abolitionist causes. Yeah, and he he was he didn't do anything about it when he was president. Okay. <laughs> he was president, and then he became – was it a representative or he was – He became a representative from Massachusetts. Yeah. So um, – which is, like you said when we were watching it's a big it, step down. It'd be it like is. if George W. Bush was like, all right, now I'm going to be a, a Texas state senator. Yeah, it's a little weird. Yeah. It's a little weird. Um, but he seems like he comes off as somebody who is dedicated and passionate about um, the law and human rights. 
And it, you know, because in the movie, this is how it's told, because it gets, you know, pushed all the way to the Supreme Court, he's like, all right, enough is enough. And Baldwin pleads with him, but he's like, all right, I will, I will help you. Um, and I really do think that Jum- both Juman Hutsu and Anthony Hopkins especially deserved awards for this. Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing performance. If the, I don't know them. if some award show has a newcomer award or like uh, maybe that's the Grammys or whatever. But like <laughs> Juman Hutsu should have been feted for his just being one of his first roles and just the power and authority that he brings to this. There's a great movie. Um, I can't remember the it's an Irish guy. He makes a bunch of movies. Can't remember the director's name now, but um, called In America, mm. where he plays. Um, it's a complicated sort of premise. Uh, Irish family, actually, it's not complicated. Irish family moves to New York, and it's the experience. It's all seen through the eyes of this young girl uh, and her family struggling. They're white. It's not that bad. Mm. Uh, and then Jimon Hunsu plays um, another guy who lives in the building. Speaking of people being loud, oh my god, who is uh, he's a painter, but he's like a very passionate and sort of like. Uh, you know, mercurial kind of figure, sure. and kind of scary for this little girl, but she sort of gets to know him better. And um, mm. it's it's a pretty good movie. It's kind of cheesy, but it's it's a great showcase for his talents. I was mm. going to say that they, speaking of laundering things, they yeah. launder the <laughs> reputation of American capitalism. Yep, <laughs> I lied. I'm going to go the whole way. That's okay. Go for it. And they also uh, sort of launder the ambitions of somebody like John Quincy Adams. Who cares? I mean, obviously, if you can help yeah. out in a situation like right. this, you do. Mm-hmm. But they, his arc kind of becomes, without stating it, you know, plainly, that he is trying to get out from the shadow of John Adams. Ever heard of him? Yeah, his dad. Yeah, and even in the last sentence or the sentence, the last scene, mm-hmm. they emphasize in his argument that he's kind of doing that. He stands behind his father's or in front of his father's picture, his father's yeah. bust. Yeah, but they launder it. By Sinke talking about how in times of great stress, yes. I know that I can call on my ancestors yes. and my ancestors will help me, not just because they like me, but because this is an important cause and really it's destiny. Like mm-hmm. they have existed. Right. They lived before me. Also, I could be <laughs> at this moment to win this thing. Yep. And so that becomes his destiny as well, Adam's, because it's like everything we went through and America started. Uh, John Adams was helped frame the Constitution. Was the was a president. I became a president. Also, I could be in this position as the senior senator from Massachusetts, right. or representative, excuse me, uh, to argue this before the Supreme Court. And I would argue if the whole thing started because of slavery. Anyway, maybe if we hadn't done that, well, you wouldn't yes. have to be here. Yes. But you're here to write that wrong. Yes, and that's that's something encouraging. Right. And I, I to go back about your point about the Supreme Court, I think. You know, growing up, at least in America, I was very proud to be an American and and we're all about freedom and America uh, and stuff like that. And then, you know, as a, you grow up, you get disillusioned by that, um, especially for me when 9-11 happened. But I think part of that growing up is um, in school. It's like, oh, the president and the founding fathers. And we have so much respect uh, for the president and awe of, of everybody in our government and, and not just the president, but every bu- judge who's on the Supreme Court. And aren't they great? Isn't it fantastic? And it's just, especially the state that we're currently in, why do these people have so much power yeah. over so many things that affect millions of people's lives? And seeing this small case that is really just takes place in like a civil or property court mm-hmm. then get piled on. And the judge hears the argument and he's like, kind of seems like these guys aren't slaves. Well, and then. So maybe I'm going to rule like that, or at least it's a jury trial at that point. And then they just replace the judge. Yes. Which I, I, I'm sure happens now, but it yes. seems like that would be more paid attention to with the media and everything. But they just replace the judge with a, with a younger guy they feel like they can manipulate. Right. And. Owing to a lot of the religious themes in this movie, which take what we will out of that. Yep. Um, because they get into the Christianity, but we don't ever really get into the religion of the people from Sierra not, Leone. Not, not really. And if you're going to try to do a comparison, like a foil situation, you would do that. Yeah. But they elect a guy who's, whose family was Catholic. And so they feel, which is 
always been unpopular uh, in America, believe it or not. At least in the very beginning, yeah. And so they think that they can manipulate him, but then it's ultimately his faith which makes him go, this is not, this is unchristian what we're doing. And so he's going to let them go. And so they win again. Mm -hmm. And then, nope, uh, the president himself is going to appeal it to the Supreme Court and they've got to do it again. And I love the scene where you really just feel for CK when Matthew McConaughey keeps coming back and he goes... Oh, you're having a party. Um, I know I bad news. I told you that we won, but we've got to do it again. And Sinke's like, what kind of country is this? Yeah, that makes no sense. The laws don't mean anything. Yeah, what's up with your chiefs? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got to get your chiefs straight. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's Again, upsetting. in the hands of a filmmaker who would care to do it, yep. I think there's a lot of uh, commentary to be made. Did we? I forget. And then you watch Lincoln. Yeah, right. Which is kind of a sequel to this. Kind of. Literally. Also Spielberg. Yep. <laughs> Literally, chronologically, but also a revisitation of colonial, post-colonial America. And civil rights. Yep. And it and is slavery. also not, it's more just a, boy, can you imagine that one lanky guy could get all these people to agree on something? Right. And it has nothing really to do, I mean, look, it's an amazing, it's similar to this and that it's an amazing movie with a ton of stars, great performances, and the production design is just insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also like, what are we talking about here? We're talking right. about business. Right. And and capitalism, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I do feel like Abraham Lincoln did a lot of great things, but, you know, we weren't around then. Hot take on Abraham Lincoln coming. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, we weren't around then. They didn't split and, no rails. Right. And, like, who writes the history? The victors write the history. So I don't know if he you know, everything that he did, but I feel well, like... Well, Steven Spielberg writes the history. Well, you're absolutely right. Paints him with a really good brush. But, I mean, I do think overall he did... It seems like he did more good things than bad things. It seems to be in the movie that after they're liberated, you know, the U.S. sends them home, when in reality the U.S. went, you're free, goodbye. Yeah, and then, like, you're on your own. They didn't do anything. How, how they, and it The was, only life they know is being on the plantations. Right, but it was the abolitionist groups, which at that time were mostly faith-based. You know, sure. they were backed by that makes um, sense. religious organizations, which is why I think that that is undivorceable from, you know, the story and especially the movie and what happens. And yep. so it was like a collection from some of these abolitionist groups that paid for them to go back home. Yeah. That makes sense. We just, the U.S. is like, all right, good luck. I know. And it's like, like the abolitionists you would think after fighting all this time would think about, but this is something that maybe you don't think about unless you're exactly in that situation. Like, how can we help these people create their own independent lives? Well, they wanted to send them back home. But that didn't happen. No, it did. Did it? No, I'm saying, yes. What I'm saying is at the end, we see them sailing back home. In, in this film. And it is implied yeah. that the uh, America paid for that, especially yeah, because yeah. the judge, the Catholic judge says, you know, they'll be released and then at, you know, at uh, the government's discretion being sent back to blah, blah, blah. If that's their choice. They didn't do that. They would have just opened those bars and just said 43 oh, okay. bla- homeless black men on the streets. And it was the people with the Bibles that the movie kind of laughs at the whole movie um, that then we don't see gave them money and clothes and stuff and then paid okay. for their voyage back to Sierra okay. Leone. I, I misunderstood. I thought we were still talking about the slaves that That's why you can't um, Lincoln you wonder freed. why other than like just, you know, what is this a Michael Bay film? Like uh saluting the cross in America. Right. Or a Zack Snyder film, I guess. Right. What's up with that? Mm, um, I don't know. But uh you you get the idea that like it's got a very religious bent. And I don't think that that's necessarily true of Jewish filmmaker Steven Spielberg, right. but I do think that he is acknowledging that you can't discount um, the religious groups' involvement in this. They and were they were yes. key for the whole thing, and, and Stellan Skarsgård yeah. and Morgan Freeman. You know, they are part of this yes faith based organization. Right, 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 right. Who um, saw the value, mm-hmm. or saw the uh, the spiritual. And moral value in freeing these people, well, and but not from the chains yeah. of capitalism. I know. And connecting to our boy MLK Jr., you know, that's when he got controversial. He was always controversial, but when oh, he sure. started talking about how really the root of all this is is, is capitalism mm-hmm. and the fact that we are at each other's throats about this sort of thing. Yeah, of course, 
Of course you're not going to give anything to disadvantaged people. Of course you're not going to help the, the American black man and woman out of this situation. Right. Because you're not going to give them any money or do and, anything. And you're you probably... Gonna, you're not going to acknowledge that you owe them anything. No, and you're probably like... Pay us like you owe us for all the years that you hold us. Oh. Mr. Jay-Z. Oh, perfect. I mean... You... Okay. And then I th- feel like, like you were saying, that was really controversial at the time. And um, I feel like also... Um, the American government was like, we got to do something about this guy. He's going to ruin our whole thing. Our whole thing is capitalism, but we right, don't well, want to focus on that. Not a show of conspiracy theories on the day that we honor yeah, the man, I, I, but I know. just saying, look at a lot of it. Yep. <laughs> a lot of it uh, doesn't seem to add up so much. No. Um, what year of his life would Chadwick Boseman have played Martin Luther King? <laughs> that would be right um, about now, right? That would be on the list for sure. Of uh, that would have come out twenty twenty three. Yep, yep. This weekend. Yep. Um, oh, man, Lee Daniels that's producing. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we don't need one black guy to play all the famous black guys. No, in the world. <laughs> I mean he kind of did for a while <laughs> he did. there. He absolutely yeah, did. Yeah, including I would say Black Panther. That's a, a famous uh, comic book black guy. So you know that Honsu must have read for it. Oh, a hundred percent. And they were like. You're already in Guardians, so... <laughs> well, that's never stopped them before. I know. But also maybe a little old. God, he's like almost 60. Is he really? He might be 60. God, I wouldn't have guessed that. Doesn't look it. No, no, Looks no. Looks great. Yeah. Amistad too. Let's do it. Uh, would you recommend <laughs> this film? Oh my God, 100%. I think uh, it is eye-opening in a lot of ways and like you you know, it's historically based but it's fictionalized so you have to take that with a little bit of grain of salt. Yeah, this stuff basically happened it did but they do move a lot of stuff around yeah and but i think um wonderful performances i feel like spielberg did a great job uh with directing it um i i feel like like you said there's a lot of hats in it but i feel like you can follow it i feel like it's a wonderful story yeah. um and and horrific at the same time <laughs> yeah um doesn't, but doesn't spare you that no it and i don't think it should it that's not what it's here to do um i think that morgan freeman said so basically people are positive on this if they remember it because it kind of, it didn't bomb necessarily, but it didn't really make a ton of money and people didn't really talk about it afterwards. I remember it and I feel and like I, think, I was shown it in school at some I think point. people responded posit- positively to it. One guy who, I think it was maybe The Atlantic, said like, it's so schmaltzy and it's so, which, you know, it, he's not, I mean, it's Steven Spielberg, he's not wrong. Parts and of And Morgan it. Freeman said specifically that he thought it was a great movie. He was proud to be a part of it. Yeah. And he thought that <clears throat> some of the scenes, like the slave ship scene, went like overboard. <laughs> Bad choice of words. Uh. <laughs> but went too far. <laughs> but uh, okay. But he had talked to Spielberg, and Spielberg said, look, I, I want people to know what happened. Yeah. I don't want right. it to be... And I'm Steven Spielberg saying this. I don't want it to be a sanitized thing. I right, want to right, know right. people to know what the stakes were. Absolutely. And what we're talking about, like what they yeah. escaped. Uh-huh. And he he starts in the hole, you know, because he starts, we can infer what's happening. We understand and we maybe identify with the slaves. But at the beginning, like, yes. it's brutal. And they are it portrayed. Is. We're kind of like, a fa- it's a fake dog kick <laughs> yes. before we save the cat Kicking later. the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they seem weird and otherworldly and, and violent yes and then then we understand later like what they went through and you're like anybody would have done the same thing absolutely 100 percent. i would recommend it as well i've always had a soft spot in my heart for this since i saw it in 1998 on martin luther king day oh my god i didn't know that yeah that was <laughs> that's a lot it <laughs> was affecting yeah uh like i said it's schmaltzy but i think this is a good use of spielberg's talents yes whereas now he is producing new installments of his long dead uh, action franchise. Yeah. He's remaking for some reason one of the best films ever made. Yeah. And he's making self abusing uh hagiography of his own past. And getting awards for it yes. too. Yes. And he's what? putting his amazing ability to make anything look cinematic and luminous and wonderful. It's much better served to do stuff like this. Even Lincoln, yes. for all of its great production design, is very gray yeah. <laughs> and sort of uh, and dirty looking, but this looks amazing. It does. It it sucks you in, and it's compelling, and you can't help but you know root for these characters and think think a little bit, think a little bit. Yeah, I gotta think about this. We could talk, but money talks. So talk more bucks.
Well, that's our show. At the end of it, do we find any connection between Skin and Marink and Amistad? Um, parts of them are both scary. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, they're... they're both thrillers in their own way. Yeah, they are. Um, let's see. I mean, it's not... Uh, Jumon Hutsu wants to get back to his family. The kids <laughs> are wondering where their parents are, so there's that. <laughs> um... Uh, what else? Is there anything else? All all cinema, all art is about, this isn't true, a lot of art is about pain. Yes. And pain, you could you could do art about- And twi- abuse. The movie Twister. You could do art about uh, uh, nature putting you through pain. Yeah. What's that movie about the- about the uh, the impossible, the the tsunami or whatever. I oh, bet you there's a bad know. guy in that movie. You always sure. have to put a bad guy in because ultimately, people cause pain to other people, mm-hmm. and that's what we usually examine in art. Yeah. And so, if you take the metaphor that I believe is happening in Skin and Marink, and then you take the political and economic reality of Amistad, it's about people hurting people. Hurt people. Yep. Hurt people. Absolutely right. What I, I mean, what are what are phrase. like supposedly the three different stories that you can tell? Oh, there's more than three. Well, okay, but like you learn in school, it's like man versus man, man versus nature, and then what's the third one? Man versus God. Man versus God. Man versus. Um, and I it's guess, always well, those man. Are, maybe those are the big three. Yeah. It should be human. Man versus robot. Of course, we know that one. <laughs> of course. Man versus destiny. A hundred percent. Man versus woman. And man versus the universe. Um, it's never yeah. woman versus. It's always man versus. Something. I know it. That's why I feel like we, we should change it women. to human. Uh, anyway. Anyways, <laughs> we'll be back for Harriet Tubman Day, I guess. Whoa! Uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you can find us on social media. Just enough trope. We're still there. Go to link tr.ee forward slash just enough trope. Yes. You can find connections to all of the work that we do on the podcast. And while you're on the internet, go to your listening platform of choice. Find our show just enough trope and please 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 subscribe to the show give us a rating and a review it really does help us out Mm -hmm. that's how we're gonna get there yeah right that's how we're gonna get to the stars and follow the stars to our home that's right in africa well and we're trying to get back home too not to completely relate it to us yeah that's true it's not our situation is not to the same extent (laughs) by any means look we're we started this off comparing (laughs) ourselves to the amistad victims and we're going to end it that way too right uh we also have a coffee um, yeah yeah we have if you uh, well, if you feel inclined yeah so i mean inclined. We, we're not in a position where we um we we're destitute uh but no, and i want to mention i don't everything think we a little said, help, bit helps i think we mentioned i didn't mention earlier we are safe yeah just so everybody is clear on that we so are if so you, if you think of it uh maybe go to ko-fi.com forward slash just enough trope and uh, put a little something in the tip jar there yeah and we are still doing our patreon shows <sighs> as well yes so uh, we're doing another animatification, which yes, should be are. out shortly. That's uh, a different uh, show. Different, it is. But that's, uh, yeah. That's I know. And we're too. doing our Just Enough Trope. So you can uh, find all those chance. links on there. Uh, give us a nice rating. Would you uh, give us five plows? <laughs> we talk about plows a lot. Wow. There's a difference between a plow and a, and a person. That, I mean, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> right. right. Kinda, hey, in, still in the, I'm, I'm kind of cute and I'm just kind of doing weird stuff. Yeah. Before he really started swinging for the uh, for the Oscars. All right, all right, all right. He does say all right once in this movie. Yeah, yeah, like, but it's not. All right, all right, Senke, come it's, on. It's not quite in the same intonation, so. <laughs> Give us five stars. We'd appreciate it. We'll be back next week to talk about something else. Until then, we're signing off. I'm your host, Caliban. I'm your co-host, Mikan Hana. Keep the geek fires burning. <laughs> <laughs>